Welcome to the Video Insiders Podcast. This is Carlos uh, hunkering down Pacheco. <laughs> I thought you'd forgotten your name here. And this is Tom just trying to survive Martin. <laughs> and we are two self-isolating video behind the scenes strategists on the old YouTube and video platforms these days. It's not just YouTube. We're expanding our horizons as, as we start to see how YouTube's just, you know, YouTube's over. We all know it. YouTube's <laughs> over. <laughs> it's not over, but it is getting increasingly difficult to make a sustainable business from from youtube adsense exactly uh, i must right. say though i'm not I'm, i wouldn't class myself as really self-isolating anymore me and you're the, right me and the kids went to the beach yesterday uh, and it wasn't wow. you know, it wasn't like um the spring break in the u.s pictures or there were some famous pictures of some like thousands of people on the beach uh it was more like six people on the a couple of miles worth of beach yesterday we went to a particularly quiet one but yeah i'd say uh life is going slowly back to normal ish here in the uk uh, masks come into uh mandatory requirement on fri next friday i think which is kind of a bit backwards like why wasn't it like done two months ago yeah um but uh, you know that's fine and like tonight actually i'm going on my first trip into kind of central london for maybe four or five months so wow i'm going to a restaurant and a cocktail bar socially distanced style so this will be very interesting that's very interesting like for me as well last week um well last week i went to a drive-in movie cool. that was a interesting experience i mean it's crazy to think of like drive-ins making a comeback and then this week is my wife's birthday so we went to a patio restaurant here in downtown toronto and uh it was still awkward <laughs> i have to say a little bit of uh, social anxiety kicking in but it's feeling good. And tomorrow I'm taking her, us, the family, uh, meaning us and our fur babies, our dogs, <laughs> to a picnic, you know, a, and a beach sort of location to, to hang out a bit. Happy birthday, as I am. As I um, titled her on Twitter, you're much, much, much better half. Uh, but also, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure how much you want to talk about it or can talk about it. But there's another kind of family celebration, especially for your better, better half, because she's launched something pretty big this week. Yeah, she launched her baby that sort of conceived a little bit over a year ago while we were on vacation. Essentially, she launched a company called Flywheel. She got a lot of press about it. With a PH, Flywheel with a PH. Yeah, yeah exactly. Flywheel. We'll, we'll put it in the link below, self-promotion here. Essentially, just to, to give you the Coles notes about this is that, you know, my wife runs a marketing agency. And when it comes to marketing, like th there are a lot of like big brands bringing marketing in-house. And then there are a lot of startups who want to build internal marketing departments, but a lot of people don't have the, that experience. And then they sometimes want to hire an agency, but agencies, you know, they have a lot of overhead. So it costs a lot of money to, to, to hire an agency. And essentially she created a platform for startups and entrepreneurs to get agency style insights and research and help at a much more affordable price. You know, the way it works is, is, you know, very much like a software as a service model, but we called it, I was making a joke. It's called uh, agency as a service model. So, nice, ass. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's got, you know, it's got so many, it's, it's very deep. Essentially there's courses, there's research, there's insights, there's a full on community, there's one-on-one -on -one coaching. So, you know, we'll put a link in it below. Uh, I mean, I don't do it service, but we had they had a, basically a great launch. Even the old Gary V gave him a, a big yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, I saw that. Flavor, 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 flavor. <laughs> you saw the flavor, flavor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> that I'm was a ma massive public enemy fan as well. So. <laughs> I'm really proud of the work they've done. It's it's fascinating stuff. They're gonna have like webinars with well known, you know, experts and and all that sort of stuff. So it's it's a very premium type of service, and uh, I think it's well, I mean, premium meaning like premium, but 
you know, at the end of the day, it's so in need for many companies because the quick sales pitch here is that we would often get clients. This is when I was working there and tired to do a better job uh, explaining this, but we would get a client and they were like, we would onboard them, work with them. Then we realized that the internal team were all juniors and didn't know anything about marketing. So we would end up coaching them for months on end. And then after a couple of months, the client's like, thank you very much, move on. But the world of marketing is never just you learn and then that's it. It's consistently, you consistently have to like be on top of it. And internal marketing teams, I personally believe it's a good idea to have an internal marketing team. But what often happens with internal people is that they become complacent. You teach them one thing and then that's all they do. They don't evolve beyond it. And that's why I, I love the idea of like having this service where in the internal marketing, yeah. sort of the executor or coordinator needs can just come into this and ask some questions and get some coaching and enough pitching. But and that's essentially the the, the, the cause notes of that. Oh, that sounds really cool. And if, if they're doing kind of like expert webinars and stuff like that, well, Tara is very, very lucky to have you as a husband. Uh, yeah because you can drop me a line and say, Tom, we need a YouTube expert to come. <laughs> 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 couldn't resist. Of course, of course. No, 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 uh, of course. Not, not even gonna, not even gonna say anything. Don't rise to it. Don't, don't feed the yeah, trolls. Exactly. Don't feed the trolls. Yeah, exactly. Before we get started, obviously, we want to thank our founding sponsor, TubeBuddy. TubeBuddy is the ultimate tool for creators to streamline their daily workflow on YouTube. I love TubeBuddy. I constantly educating clients on features that they didn't know about. One of the features that I, you know, helped a client understand this week and actually helped me a lot was their backup feature, the ability to backup all your metadata into a CSV, which is super practical because there are ways to use that CSV as a backup in case your account gets hacked or something happens, right? The example that the client told me is that they were hacked and then somebody completely erased all their video, not erased their videos, but erased all the titles and the metadata and the thumbnails. Thankfully, they're big enough that YouTube helped them out, but now they wanted some sort of like you know, way to do this on their own. And this was the solution for them. So this is a great feature of TubeBuddy. Tom or TubeBuddy, tell the, <laughs> their our My audience. Name's G -Buddy. My middle name's TubeBuddy. <laughs> tell our audience how people can sign up and with our special offer. Yeah, you can get a worldwide exclusive multi-channel discount only through Video Insiders by visiting videoinsiders.fm forward slash TubeBuddy. Thank you, too, buddy. Thanks, too, buddy. This is our first interview in a while. This one, I have to fully admit that I was like so, you know, impressed by the interview. The person interviewed is Paul Sampson. I did not know about Paul Sampson. I did not know about Licked before, but it sounds like an amazing feature. And I was, my mind was blown of this interview. Actually, you know, it's, it's not even about the interviewer. It's about the guests. Nah. <laughs> Finally, I thought I'd graduated. So. That's, 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 that's revenge for, for, for cheating on me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, honestly, you know, Licked offers a service to get your music pre-cleared, licensed music pre-cleared on YouTube. So tomorrow you want to use Rihanna. And again, that's, I don't know for sure if Rihanna is part of their list, but if you want to use, you'll see, you'll get this joke, but after listening, but if you want to use ASAP Rocky <laughs> <laughs> and other artists, you get in touch with Licked and they'll pre-clear your video and you're not going to be taken down and you're actually going to make money from that video. Yeah. That to me is a service that blew my mind. So Palm, I'll let you sort of set it yeah, up. Yeah, and I'd, 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 I'd have to correct you slightly and it's not a service. You're not, you know, it's not like you're phoning up and saying, hey guys, can I pre-clear this ASAP Rocky track to go into my uh, YouTube video and how much will it cost? It's not like... Uh, uh, old fashioned service like that it's like software as a service so you click a few buttons select the track and it's done by a machine instantly this is not like an old licensing model in which i used to work years ago when people would phone me up and say i want to license a clip of the office to use in my clip show so yeah really incredible um i've known paul actually for a couple of years now um they've been doing a lot of really great 
grassroots marketing with like small create organizations here in London. Uh, they now have a sponsorship booth at events like Vid Summit and VidCon. They're really starting to break through and very much deserved. Paul is a great guy uh, based here in London. Um, I've been into their offices a few times and I've uh, been lucky to, to meet Paul several times. So yeah, I, I think that's enough introduction and I think it'd be great to just dive in and hear what Paul's got to say about what they're currently doing and what's coming in the future. Uh, let's get to it. Uh, so it is with great pleasure that I welcome Paul onto the podcast. Paul, for people who haven't heard of you or haven't heard of Licked, can you just let us know a little bit more about uh, who you are and like your background, your career, and how you got to co-found the awesome company that is Licked? Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, absolutely. So Licked is the world's first um, claims-free commercial music licensing platform for creators which essentially allows for the moment YouTubers, but down the line, Facebook creators, Instagram influencers, and so on, um, to license music from their favorite artists into their content whilst keeping their ad revenue uh, and not being um, reprimanded by the music industry or losing their ad sense to a copyright claim. Uh, and we've, we do that by um, when we develop some proprietary in-house software called Vouch, we called it Vouch because it literally vouches on behalf of our users. Uh, the music industry partners that we sign integrate that software into their YouTube CMS. And uh, essentially, it, that software clears a copyright claim for our users if they have legally licensed the song from Licked. So um, for anyone that doesn't know, up until now, if you used a famous song in a YouTube video, um, more often than not, your video would still be played. It would still be left up on YouTube, but you would be deprived of the privilege of, of taking home the AdSense revenue that you generated from the video uh, because the music industry would presume you hadn't licensed the song because there was nowhere to license it, and they would appropriate your revenues by way of a copyright claim. So, um, yeah, Licked, yeah, think of Licked as Spotify for creators, that's our end goal. That's the mission. That's where we're headed. I, I just want to jump in here because, like, I remember when I first met you at, at an event and you explained Lick to me, and my head literally exploded because, <laughs> like, I, I, you've said that in such like a humble and calm way. But this is really a big deal. <laughs> this, re this, this really is a big deal for creators and media companies to be able to use commercial music without paying ridiculous amounts of money or having to like retroactively clear something that might already exist in like a TV clip or something like that is pretty unheard of. And, and I've seen how it works and it is like seamless and like your catalog is great and it's growing. And I, yeah, I remember when we first met and yeah, I was like, so this is not real. This is like real, real music that people can use. So yeah, I just like want to hammer home to if you haven't quite grasped the concept, people listening to this, you can use full commercial tracks in your YouTube videos without fear of getting claimed. Yeah, uh, you know, I heard a really, uh, I heard a really great um, quote at one point, and I think it was like the sign of. Um, a great piece of technology or software is that it's indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think like, you, you know, you can stick that on a poster somewhere, Paul, that <laughs> licked just works like magic. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's fantastic. So sorry to interrupt, but I just really wanted to hammer home just how incredible this is as a service and as, as a piece of tech. So going back to like your story and like how, how did, cause I know you were kind of deeply embedded in the music industry for a, a long time. And of course I don't think you would have been able to pull this off without that. So I'd love to hear like how licked came to be. Sure. Well, so I mean, I mean there, there's a few, th is it, I can draw like a straight line through sort of two or three experiences in my professional career that have led me to licked. Right. And one, one was that straight out of uni, I actually worked in television for five years. So uh, I did everything from making the tea to, at the beginning of those five years to being a series producer and or host, right, at the end of it. But, I, but in the middle of that, there was one episode where um, my director got sick. And as the, as the researcher on the shoot, I was asked to go into an edit and direct the editor, right? You were on the shoot, Paul. 
you know where the gold is, like help this editor turn this into a two hour edit, not a six hour edit, right? Um, you know what the director was thinking, et cetera, et cetera. And I got so excited and I went home that night ready for the next day and I pulled all these CDs off my shelves and I was like, oh my God, I get to create my own piece of film. And I, and I pulled all this, this, these CDs, I thought I could put this song here and that song there. And I walked into the edit the next day and the editor looked at me and he said, what's that? And I said, oh, it's the music for the edit. And he said, we've got a music budget. And I said, no, 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 I, I own this music. He said, what do you mean you own the music? I said, I bought the CDs, like they're mine. And he was like, no, Paul, <laughs> that's not how it works. And I was like, what are you talking about? So I'm going back like 21 years now. But I, I, first of all, like most YouTubers, I was aghast that I actually had to license music, right? But that was my first that was my first inkling that this was an actual thing. And what he did... Wait, so are, you, are you saying that I can't just write no copyright infringement intended in the <laughs> description and get away with it. Well, well, it depends what you mean by get away with it. <laughs> no, no, you can't. Um, so, so you know, he pointed to the walls of the edit suite, which were just shelves. And in these shelves were endless CDs. And he said, do you know what those are? I said, no. He said, that's called production music. It's music made for production because commercial music is either too inaccessible, too hard to clear or too expensive. And I was like, oh, well, how do I search it? And he was like, you just got to go through the CDs. And I was like, well, that sounds like nonsense. So that was like the first thing, right? That was my first like, okay, why is it so difficult to use commercial music? I then started to get to know the production music companies quite well because I had to use them in every show I produced after that. And there was one in particular that was doing a really, really good job of sounding quite commercial. Uh, and that was a company called Extreme Music. Uh, and when I jumped ship from television, I wanted to move to the States and Extreme Music uh, offered me a job in New York. Uh, and long story short, I spent five years between New York and LA working for Extreme and became the head of the US. Um, but the, the, the second um, step in this straight line through to Licked was production music recreates the sound of commercial music as closely as it can, right? But it's never going to have the heart and soul of of an artist's um, imagination. It's just trying to recreate that for a usable piece of produ produ production music. But by the time I'd moved to LA in 2007, the, you know, the, the for what, excuse my friends, but the arse had fallen out of the sales, of sales in the music industry, right? Uh, first there'd been Napster, then there'd been iTunes. Record companies couldn't charge 15 quid for one CD versus 9.99 for another because they no longer own the, the means of distribution, right? It all gone digital. And something like 80% had been wiped off the sales market in music as a result. And so we were able to approach really big artists. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Tom, but when you go to Sainsbury's and they've got Kellogg's cornflakes and then they've got Sainsbury's own cornflakes, Kellogg's makes that Sainsbury's brand, right? And they just don't put as much effort into the packaging. And they're saying to Sainsbury's, all right, well, we understand people want a non-brand version that's cheaper. Why don't we take up that market as well, right? So we'll make you Sainsbury's own. We want a piece of both, wherever the customer goes. And we thought to ourselves, well, actually, given that major artists are now um, earning far less than they were, why don't we approach them and show them that, you know, if you went up to Snoop, for instance, and said, hey, Snoop, Snoop, listen to these three albums that we have imagined to be titled West Coast Hip Hop 1, 2, and 3, uh, all of which were written by John Smith in Bournemouth and that <laughs> generated £750,000 in sync fees and royalties in the last 18 months. And please tell us who you think it reminds you of. Uh, then Snoop will say, well, that sounds like me. That's my. That's like my sound. And you say, yeah, well, wouldn't you like to get in on that? And so we were able to convince people like Snoop and Quincy Jones and Massive Attack and Hans Zimmer uh, and people like that. I, I, I didn't bring all those people to the table by any means, right? But I was part of that growing act. They'd started it before I got involved. But um, we were able to create, ask these artists to create, the, recreate their own sound. Now, they didn't, they didn't go down as a writer. They didn't go down as a performer because then they would, the music would be owned by their commercial publisher or their commercial label. 
but they essentially exec produced, right? They, they music they had um, formulated with friends or other artists that they knew that they could bring on board. It's almost like creative direction. Um, and I saw the power of being able to license something so close to the commercial sound at the click of a button, right? And, and we won huge market share from our competitors in the States, in Australia, and in Europe by saying, well, if you can't afford Snoop, we've got Snoop making his own production music. And you can't afford real film score from the actual movie, well, Hans Zimmer and Harry Gregson Williams produced our film score, right? And these guys scored Pirates of the Caribbean and so on and so forth. And that was the sort of the second step. And the third one was when I moved back to London, um, I worked for a, uh, a commercial music company, but unsigned independent artists. Again, pre-cleared master and publishing. And again, the market share I was able to, to garner for them because of the product, because we had one stop, click and clear, um, but real artists that were available on iTunes. And essentially for 15 years, my customers were film companies, TV production companies, advertising agencies, but all of them are underpinned by production company, right? Whatever sort of production you're licensing into, there's a production company and that's your client. And at some point at the end of 2015, Tom, it occurred to me that 2.8 billion people had a production company in their pocket and the world's most generous commissioning editor in YouTube, right? And you think to yourself, well, the, actually the only means of production that hasn't been democratized is the ability to get a sync license, right? The ability to use any song you want at the click of a button in your YouTube content. And I started realizing, wow, for Gen Z and millennials, YouTube is television, Right? This is where those generations are getting all their content. What's, how would people use music on those platforms? And that's when I learned about copyright claims. That's when I learned about content ID. And I started looking around. And I thought, someone must be solving this. And no one was. In fact, the solutions that existed are really, really good companies. Right, For People like Epidemic Sounds, Audio Network, Premium Beat, so on and so forth. Right? There's even people like Music Bed and Art List. But but they were all workarounds. They were all either low quality, easy to license, sound alikes, or unsigned independent artists. Essentially, every available option other than the one that people wanted. And I thought, if you could build what people actually wanted, then you'd have something really valuable. And at that point, I was with a developer friend of mine that was at the same company, and we learned uh, as best we could the YouTube API and the, took the YouTube certifications. And he, more than me, came back and said, I think I found a way that you could actually clear copyright claims if you could speak to a database that knew a song had been licensed. And we both quit. <laughs> well, he went, he went and got a job, um, at, you know, an interim job. And I took that the summer of 2016 off. Uh, and went and started raising money because I thought, wow, I, we've got the basis of Spotify for creators here. Um, and that you can't just ignore that. So I went off and, and spoke to lots of investors and as many, you know, called as many people as I could. I didn't know any investors really, but I called people that knew investors and said, I've got this idea, I've got this plan. I think it's worthwhile. And, um, and I, got, I got one individual, one angel of a man, called Simon Davis, who is now my business partner um, and had already sold a business in the music industry, came back to me and said, I think you're right. I think this is a massive opportunity. I think there needs to be a solution. Um, and I think that we'll be able to, to do it. So I'm going to give you the money you need to get started. That's a, that's a, that's a massive um, vouch in itself, isn't it? That's, yeah. a, that's a massive show of confidence in not just the idea, but also you as a person, because, you know, he could have gone off and found a developer to, to, to do it himself, I'm assuming. Well, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, and you know what, like, what was good about Simon was Simon, he's already sold a business, right? He was, he was exiting his business. So he, he, he was a multimillionaire in his own right for the first time. And he, you know, he had lots of ideas about what to do with that money. And he put a lot of it into property because that's a very sound investment. But he kept a pot behind for um, what he thought he would know, right? His, his business had been in and around music rights. So uh, mainly sort of background music for pubs and clothing stores, that sort of remote jukebox delivery. 
Um, and he had lots of ideas as to how he could invest that money into a music-based business, but I was able to convince him out of all of those into this has the biggest upside. Um, and and he gave me the money to go and do it. So we, we started four years, three and a half years ago. Uh, we've been building the tech and the platform because, you know, we've got our own player and our own search and our own platform and our own back-end tech and our own YouTube CMS account and so on. Um, and whilst we set about building, I set about signing labels and publishers and convincing them of the business model because, you know, the music industry is not a big fan of YouTube. They haven't had a great experience with them. And they had a lot of trouble getting their head around the, well, why don't I just let them use it and take all their money? If I let you license it, I'm going to get less money. And me convince them of, no, this is on top of what you're earning on YouTube because these influencers, these creators that earn a living or even supplement their income from YouTube, they won't use you because you're going to steal all their money. And I said to them, if I made you work all week and then send your check back to your label bosses, would you do it? And they said, no. And I said, well, why are you asking these kids to? And and slowly but surely, we, we started winning hearts and minds. And it's, we're, we're in the middle of that process still, Tom. You know, I don't, we don't have 50 million songs, but but we're on the way there. Yeah. So what is, what's the kind of... Um... What's the uptake been so far from creators? You know, you've spoken about the reaction from the labels and your, your I know that your catalogs grow in, I would say slowly, but growing quite rapidly. Um, yeah, we can probably yeah. talk about a bit more about that later, but what, what's the uptake been so far from creators? And can you kind of speak about some of your kind of biggest hits and some of the, the bigger creators that have used licked licensed tracks? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, when you start with a small catalogue, it's quite difficult to get traction. Um, but And also, I think people hear about Licked and don't believe that it's, do, it's true, right? <laughs> it sounds too good to be true. <laughs> too good to be true. Yeah. And, and, there's, and, and to some extent, I get that. Like, a lot of the early music we signed is small independent labels. And so if you're a muso, you might know them. If you had a niche interest in drum and bass or... Um, any other uh, UK niche genre, you might go, I'm oh my still, God, this is great. I'm uh, still waiting for the UK garage, Paul. I'm still yeah, waiting. yeah, yeah, aren't we all? <laughs> there's, still, there's some coming, I can assure you. Um, so initial take-up was slow. It's growing quicker and quicker. So there are, there are I mean, at the moment, there's about 500 a week signing up, 500 creators signing up to the platform. Um, and you know that started at like five creators a week, and we were delighted with that in the early days, right? Um, the, in fact, I can still tell you to this day, the, we launched the platform and no one licensed a thing for three days. And you know, you, you can imagine the sleepless nights that I had yeah. that week. And then we were at work one day, and we got a notification that someone had just paid to license a song. And I can tell you that guy's name is Philippe Bartu. B-A-R-T-U, <laughs> because I will never forget the first time someone spent money on my platform, you know. Um, so at the moment, there's, there's, there's various efforts that we're, that we're undertaking to try and get word out to the, to the industry. We spent a lot of money on SEO that was really untargeted and didn't deliver us much. Um, and now we've started more work on, like, ambassador programs and advocates and creator-led content, which seems to be producing better results. There's just shy of 12,000 YouTubers signed to the platform today. What's the realistic target? What's the stretch target? What would you like to see in kind of 12 months' time? So in 12 months' time, um, I th- I would like to see 50,000 users using it two to three times a month. That That's the goal. Um, and then within five years, I'd want upwards of half a million. Um, that's what we're targeting. But, you know, the, uh, I can go into that a bit later, but there's Facebook and Instagram that are going to enter this market as well soon. But but um, it suddenly scales very quickly as a business when you, you've got a la carte licensing, top commercial music, and what amounts to quite a small percentage of the monetizing YouTube um, sector uh, that we would need to become a profitable and a highly scalable business. But I think what we have also learned is that there are partnerships that we can engage in with people that that run multi-channel networks, people that run um, YouTube management companies, influencer platforms, 
and or YouTube analytics platforms where we can get straight out to our target market more cost effectively um, and with better take up and results um, to a targeted market than pure digital efforts. And so we are, you know, we've just signed three contracts in the last two weeks with our first lot of those. Uh, and they, they should be a much more uh, productive route to market for us. There's one thing I would say about the, the initial take up is and I meet, you and I see each other at things like Vid Summit and VidCon and all these conferences. And now I meet, you know, you, you, you've, you've had a channel, you, you still operate your channel, right? Uh, not, not one. I've got some other channels, but not with me on camera. Right. Okay. We are trying to create a movement here, right? If, if, if and when Lit works and, and we get, we're hitting those sorts of numbers, we'll have changed this forever. And creators around the world, no matter what platform they're on, will never suffer the ignominy of having their revenue stolen by a label because there was no other solution, because there will be a solution. But there is a chicken and egg element to this, right? I've, I've met creators. In fact, this actually happened to me in Vid Summit in LA. Actually, no, it was VidCon 2019. And I, I won't say the name of the creator, but we had targeted him as someone that we thought was influential. We could get on the platform. And I was talking to him in person about what we were doing. And he said to me, oh, my God, this is amazing. Are you serious? I said, yeah, we're signing this label and that label. And he said to me, have you got ASAP Rocky? And I said, no. And I was about to say, but he signed to this label. And we're going, I couldn't even get that out of my mouth. He literally turned on his heels and walked away from me. Wow. And I, and I just thought to myself, well, that sucks because – you want ASAP Rocky, and we are the route to you getting ASAP Rocky. But without creators on board using it, the labels won't release bigger yeah. artists sooner. And actually, we need creators to get behind this and help push the train, not just try and meet us at the station, because we won't get there without the support of the creator community, and this is a solution that we're building for them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd say that's where we are at the moment. So what has it been like coming from the kind of traditional media world of production companies and distributors and music labels to working with, you know, not necessarily that guy that you're speaking about is a yeah. uh, uh, an allegory for all creators, but what has it been like going from like this kind of classic traditional industry to like this whole new world of creators and new media? Well, the the, the, the bad news for me, is that the two hardest things I've ever done is try and convince the music industry of this business model and this market and try and get hold of creators to come on board. Um, because if you think about a YouTube creator, they're essentially a small business, and I'm well-versed in business-to-business -business marketing, but it doesn't work with these small businesses because they operate and act like consumers. Yeah, they're, they're not definitely not business minded for sure. Correct. I mean, look, if I wanted to get my music in an NBC show, right, I could go on LinkedIn and search all employers at NBC and find the showrunner for the show I wanted or the music supervisor for the show I wanted. Then I could email him or I could work out his email address and I could probably find his phone number through various, you know, business development scraping tools and I could start pitching him. It's very difficult to, to get access to the creators you want without going through management. And management only want to field your calls if you're talking money. Now, we're, we're not shy of spending money with creators where we see a fit. But like I said, I'm looking for people that actually have bought into the mission rather than that are seeing dollar signs from us. Because if you don't want this as a solution, if you're not motivated to try and change the way the music industry has treated creators once and for all, then it's probably a bad spend of my of my budget, right? Because you, you'll give me a branded content video, a dedicated video, and then I'll never hear from you again unless I stump up the right cash. Whereas the creators were trying to find, A, we are, we are paying, right? We, we understand that we, that, we have, that we want to and need to do that because they, they need to earn a living. Um, but also people that really buy into what we're doing. I like to meet them, uh, or at least if they're in the States, video conference them and let them look in my eyes and see that I am like dead set on changing this once and for all. And if you want to get on this train with me, we can have a worthwhile and mutually beneficial relationship that involves us paying you 
but also working with you to make sure we change this. Not I and not licked, but we change this together. Um, so it's been very difficult working with trying to find the right ambassadors, trying to sort of identify the persona of the ambassador that would be good for licked. Like, I don't want to work with a creator who has a huge audience, but none of whom are aspiring creators. Because A, it's very expensive to work with a huge creator, and B, if the audience they're sending my message out to don't create videos themselves, then that was just a waste of money, right? Um, so, you know, identifying the sort of person we need to be backing, sort of person that was motivated to, to back the mission, um, and then how we work with them has been a, a real struggle. But we, we built a marketing team or the beginnings of a marketing team as, as of a year ago, and they are learning the market very, very quickly um, and iterating our efforts accordingly because we, you know, we need to address that efficiently. Yeah, I, I think it's clear path to market to work with like, the bigger creators and the, the influencers, like you say, that have audiences that are creating video. But I, for me and my experience with interacting with you guys as a company and seeing you at events is that even though that's like the marketing plan, I think the the kind of the heart of the business also definitely tries to look at the much smaller end of the of the spectrum in terms of size of, of creators. You do a lot with beginners and you have like communities and live events and you do a lot to help people that are just starting out on YouTube and your pricing model also reflects that, you know, it's not a flat fee for everyone. It's, it's based on like the size of your audience. Yeah. Like how important is that audience, that kind of beginner or, you know, someone getting started on YouTube to lit? And, and why are they so important? It's a really good question, Tom, actually. No one's ever asked me that. Um, the, the answer for me is, is this. One, I'm asking people to jump on our train and, and push our train to the station, right, together. And, and, and as a result, I, I want to be able to help push their train as well, right? And, and, and I think that's how we win is... is by sort of looking at that community and saying, we can all do better. We can all improve our, our skill sets and, and what we produce, um, and we can help each other. Um, if we are invested in, I mean, licked at its heart is a solution to a creator focused problem, right? And if you want people to buy into that, then you can't, to my mind, you can't just be shouting, about the one problem you solve because it's incredibly salesy, right? So you spoke about the, the live events we have and the communities that we're building, the Facebook groups and so on. This We're trying to build a communities where, people, where YouTubers can help other YouTubers solve problems that we might not have expertise in, right? So, you know, what, what, how, how, how do I make the best thumbnail? How, what camera equipment should I use early on? And how much of my budget should I be putting into each video? Well, I don't know the answers to those questions, but if you can build a community of aspiring creators of all sizes and then put them in touch with each other, then you're helping them grow. And if you help them grow, they're going to increase the, the, the production values that they have. They'll increase the revenue that they're generating and they might decide to license slightly more expensive music. Um, so I think that th th there's a cyclical mutual benefit to helping everyone along uh, the matter of size um, in that community. And, and, and I think, let's be frank about it, you never know where the next Zoella or Casey is going to come from. And, and they started out at, at 1,000 views per video as well. You know, like that's that's where everyone begins. So don't think you can be snobby about it and say we only want to work with the top creators because they're speaking to smaller creators. And if your solution isn't universal, then you, you haven't got anything valuable, I don't think. Yeah, and, you know, YouTube, is, YouTube has kind of been your weapon of choice so far. I think it makes sense because it's the, the the most robust in terms of its rights management system. Yeah. Uh, but you also mentioned, you know, Facebook and Instagram. Like, I'd love to hear more about that and your plans for that. And if, are there any other platforms that you've got your eyes on? I know that podcasting, like for me, podcasting is ancient, but it's definitely becoming – more mainstream like this week as we record you know joe, joe rogan, rogan yeah. was kind of 
aqua hired whatever it was for yeah a hundred million dollars so is that is that also like a platform that you guys could could uh well i suppose it's not a platform but uh, an, an area or a niche that you can yeah. start to branch into well 100 well let's start with the video platform as part of the question first because because i think that's interesting well i think they're both interesting but let's take them one at a time so the reason we started on youtube is because youtube has content id and the unintended consequence of content ID and providing labels with audio recognition and a CMS is that they have precluded themselves from being present in creators' content. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if you give the music industry a CMS and say you can now monetize your music or block your music, then they have created unintentionally the problem that we're solving. Right now, on Facebook and Instagram, that problem kind of exists, but not fully. And Facebook have not built their own version of Content ID. Um, it was supposed to launch. They are building it, um, but it was supposed to launch this year. The Cambridge Analytica scandal last year has pushed, pushed them back a bit. Um, but they are building that, and, and that will come with two, uh, two consequences. One it will give rights holders the CMS that we spoke about, right? They will be able to apply policies to songs like monetize or block. Uh, and similarly, they will give channels, profiles, or creators, whatever you want to call them on, on each of those, on Facebook and Instagram, the, the ability to start monetizing their content, which at the moment is reserved for sort of big media companies. So if you think about an Instagram influencer, they don't monetize their views on their Instagram content or their IG stories, right? Or their, their, their stories or their IGTV. They are monetizing their influence off platform. So if I'm a big beauty influencer, then the money I make from my Instagram presence is that a brand pays me directly into my bank account. And then I make a video about their product and put it out to my audience. I'm not making money from ad revenue against the number of views of my content. Once they launch Rights Manager, or their version of Content ID, both of those two things will happen, and that's when the problem is is created that we would solve. Now, we, we, we are in constant contact with Facebook about when we can tweak our software to work with their API, um, but there's no point doing that until the problem is fully created. So the moment Facebook uses a third-party piece of software called uh, Audible Magic, it's the same one that YouTube used before they built their own version of it, but it doesn't allow the CMS, doesn't allow the application of policies. So, um, so that's why we're waiting. We don't have any other choice but to wait. So Facebook and Instagram will certainly be um, first, uh, but we, we so you asked what we've got our eye on. I'm watching TikTok quite closely because... Right now, again, TikTok does not allow its creators to monetize their content. They are making all of their money, if they have any influence, off-platform through brands. And, you know, if I was getting 5 million views of my dance to a song on TikTok, I would be quite miffed that I wasn't earning anything out of that and that I would have to wait for a brand to pay me to put out another piece of content. I had, uh, I had someone in a Facebook group... It's saying exactly that they'd had one video that went viral this week and like okay how do i make money from this now yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's like well it's a bit too late yeah yeah and, and and just two weeks ago i saw an article saying that instagram had stopped letting agencies and brands i think from using music uh, and that was because the deal they've got with the music industry at the moment means that most of the money being generated by tiktok is going out the door to the music industry where the content uses music the only person not owning is the creator. That won't last. I can't see that lasting. Um, specifically not in Europe, where something where, where Article 13 is passed, um, and they are obliged to find audio to build audio recognition tools and let people block and monetize content. So that regulation, that movement, and the increasing in number of platforms means that I think that we are very well placed uh, as a business to be future proofed. Right, uh, there's not there's going to be more than just YouTube over the coming years, and if you think about Facebook and Instagram, well, it's 3.7 billion profiles on those two platforms, and 
on YouTube, eight percent of channels monetize. If one percent of three point seven billion monetized, you're looking at thirty seven million channels, right? It's, it's it's almost twenty times the size of the problem that we're trying to solve on YouTube um, and TikTok. God knows how many profiles there are on TikTok. It's over a billion, I think, isn't it? Um, so uh, so yes, that is a space we're looking at very closely. Podcasting again, it, it, it's a weird. It's a weird cross between sort of democratized home production and media companies. It's a nonsense. I mean, there's something like 750,000 weekly global podcasts, and not, not a single one of them is legally a, a, a able to get the music rights for any music they put in the podcast. And, and absolutely, we want to solve that. Well, if you think of Lict as Mecca for micro licensing, right? Democratized production. And we want to be a solution for all of those um, sectors. And so we are in very early stage talks with one of the world's leading podcast networks to try and build a minimum viable product for them, which if it works, we would try and scale out to the entire sector. But the reason that we don't let them just license off the platform as it is, is because our, mon- our, our pricing model is based off of YouTube CPMs. And a CPM in podcasting is wildly different. It, it's inordinately high, actually, um, compared to the video sector. So, um, you know, for us to get the rights from labels and publishers to be able to license into that, we have to show them that we've worked out the unit economics and that we have a solution that prices up a podcast in the same way we currently price up a YouTuber, but taking into account what brands are paying to be involved in the content. Um, without a podcast network working with us that's very difficult to do um and that's why we're, we're, we're pursuing that but yes that those two areas are very interesting for us okay so apart from other platforms what else is in the future for lit so could it like what what's coming in terms of um new catalogs what's coming in terms of like new features stuff like that but also just curious you know let's say and this is me just thinking out loud. Let's say you get to the point where you've you've solved music. Could you ever then become the micro licensor for video? For example, I want to do a review of the latest Star Wars movie, but I also don't want my video to be claimed by Disney. Is that something that you guys have ever thought of, or is that just a bridge too far at this point? Uh, it's not. I don't think it's a bridge too far at this point. It's exactly what, how I was going to answer your question. Actually, is that there, there is, in theory, there is no reason why our software wouldn't work for video, right? Because all our software is doing is interacting with content ID uh, and down the line with rights manager on Facebook and Instagram, right? Not that's not done yet, obviously. But um, so wherever content ID recognizes content, our software would be able to clear that content if if it had been licensed. I think we'd be taking our eye off the ball if we were to build the clip and video version of Lict side by side, because I think we need to get this right first uh, and prove that model, and then it would be infinitely easier to convince the film and TV sector of the value of such a product. Um, plus, I mean, in order to be able to store that amount of content and license it, we need a lot more money than how we're currently funded. Um, but I think within two years, it's something we could look at. If we were if we were hitting our targets on the music side, I could very much go out to the venture capital community and say, listen, this isn't just a problem for music. It's a problem for people that want to review TV shows and films, right? And, and actually, if we could offer the, those sectors an additional revenue stream on YouTube on top of them claiming, then I think we've got a mirror image market. Um, in terms of our imminent plans, there's, there's a few things we want to get out the door. We're building a, a marketing dashboard um, as we speak, uh, and that um, that is quite interesting. And what that does is essentially it's what we're licked is a tool for creators, and that's the front end of what we're doing. We're also building a tool for the music industry. So if you imagine you're the you're the global head of marketing for Warner Music, Tom, and you've got 20 offices around the world that report into you and the head of all those offices, and they have to make, I don't know, 10 songs a hit, and I mean real revenue and real reach in, them, in their local market and or globally each quarter. 
There's a lot of pressure on these people. Now, if I'm that territory's head of marketing, I know the Spotify playlist are in my country for indie rock, right? And I'm releasing this indie rock song. I know his name. I know his email address. I know his mobile number. I know his LinkedIn profile. I know his office address and his landline, right? I know how to lobby that guy. I know the story I've got to tell him to make sure that song is playlisted and all the right playlists for it to, to sort of get traction and streamed a lot. Similarly, I know all the right information, B2B, for the radio pluggers. How do I find that data on the creators? There is no solution currently, right? Now, I could go to an influencer platform and say, my artist audience is this old and this gender in this country, and they could tell me which creators have that audience. But they couldn't tell me which ones of them like my artist or have searched for my artist or streamed my artist or anything like that. Right. So what Lix will be able to do is when we have users using the platform regularly, we can start to build up a music profile on them. It's sort of a music lens through which to view the YouTube data. And therefore, if I'm the head of marketing at a, la at a label, I can say, well, hang on a minute, I'm releasing an indie, an indie rock song in this territory intended for 13 to 23, four year old girls. Um, licked is there anyone that has that sort of audience that has either searched for my artist before or only ever licenses indie rock and if we find a match then that song would be presented back to the creator when they logged in as a potential free license so i, I want to be able to offer creators the ability to use the new song from their favorite artist without paying if there's a mutual benefit to the label and the creator does that make sense yeah, that's really smart. So, so, so that's what the one thing we're doing. That that relies on us building out our personalization engine. So, you know, the moment, w what is Tom Martin searching for on Lit? Not just what he's licensing, right? You might have licensed just indie rock and just these artists, but you might have searched for ten artists we don't have. And how yeah. can we create an alert system so that when that comes on the onto the platform, we're letting you know. Um, and, and provide that sort of two-way match between the industry and, and the creators. Um, there is another area that we're... That we're uh, this one I can't say much about because the deal is not done. Um, but there has been um, a huge movement in the last three months from the music industry into sort of virtual concerts, virtual festivals, and, and some in-game play. Um, and all of that has repercussions on those streaming platforms for anyone that wants to repurpose that content. And those repercussions are exactly what YouTuber faces. Um, and so the music industry is becoming more and more aware of, well, actually, if, if we want to engender attendance and then encourage repurposing of the content because it's in the artist's interest or the song's interest, then should we find a way to do that without them being punished? And that comes straight back to the vouch solution. So there are things that we hadn't accounted for three months ago that are suddenly new opportunities for us, either, either in gaming and or in just in virtual performance, um, sort of problems that are arising that you have been aware of for a long time, just for now for music fans on those platforms as well. So that's where our focus is uh, mid, mid to long term. Really exciting stuff. And I can, I can only see this growing and growing and as your catalogue grows and so will your audience. And hopefully this will help to shine a little bit of light on, as, as I say, something that I wholeheartedly recommend, hashtag not sponsored. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. as I say, something that, just, something that just works and makes sense. And I think YouTube don't make it easy. If anything, YouTube are making it, making it harder. They're just about to basically turn off the uh the part of the audio library where you can find out whether or not you can even use a music track and get yeah. playing yeah which to me is complete madness well look Tom, uh, I, I, I want to see everyone makes it hard for us because because <laughs> th this has never been done before right so even on the music industry side that you wouldn't believe the battles i have to fight on behalf of creators on a daily basis and and the, you know we've got we've got i won't say which one but we've got one label that that won't integrate our software, right? But they have given us like a dedicated 
number of staff around the world, so so LA, New York, and London, that that when you license a song from Lict, they will manually release the claim, right? As long as you've been compliant with the terms and conditions. And actually, you know, that wasn't that wasn't good for us. I was like, look, we operate the software or bust. But their their artists are so big that they wanted to test with us. All right, well, let's see if there's take up, and then we'll integrate the software. So we're quite clear on the website. If you license from that label, it tells you, listen, this is what you need to do for this song. But you might put it unlisted. You might get a claim, but it'll be released within whatever it is, 90 minutes, right? Yeah. Um, it's about at the moment. That's only the case on one percent of all the songs in the catalogue. But it's uh, honestly every day we break new ground, and and that is difficult to do but really heartening and rewarding when it happens. In April last year, Tom, we had 275 labels and publishers signed. And, and, and me and one other person did that ourselves in the first two and a half years. Because we've raised investment, because people are getting behind us, um, we've now upped 275 to 6,700 and we're growing at more than 275 labels and publishers a week right now. I didn't even know there were that many labels in the world. Oh, sure man, we, we are, I mean, that's still only 10% of the, I mean, maybe even 1% of the music industry. But it, the big news is that included in those 6,700, that there were some big players that you need to get because they, they own uh, you know half the world's music. We have, in the last few months, signed Universal Music, which is the biggest label in the world. 34% of music revenues go through Universal Music. We've signed Warner Music, which is the third biggest label in the world. That deal was done three weeks ago, and they've already opted in artists like Stormzy, Charlie XCX, Rita Ora. Now, we, we have to clear the publishing on these, right? It's not like every track's going to go live straight away. Um, Rudimental, Plan B, Liam Gallagher, um, We've signed Cobalt, the fifth biggest publisher, BMG, the fourth biggest publisher, and Universal Music Publishing, the sister company of the label, which is the third biggest publisher. So like five out of the top seven music companies in the world have now signed with Licks, uh, and that has taken most of the three years we've been working on it. So we're at a tipping point, right? In the next three weeks there will be upwards of 300,000 songs from labels and publishers waiting to go live on Licked. And that has taken a lot of backbreaking work to get us to that point. And that's what's really exciting, that this is slowly starting to look like everything we've envisioned. Um, and everyone told us we wouldn't be able to do it, and, 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 and we're getting there. That's amazing. And that's I think that's encouragement to anyone in the industry that's working on something a little bit different myself included who's working on some little kind of startup projects that are like you say every day you have to break new ground and find a new way to get around a problem so that's really encouraging i've got one final question that's really really important cool and this is going to make or break the entire interview (laughs) have you got asap rocky (laughs) we don't have asap rocky oh well on that note on that note (laughs) I'm going to have to cut you off, Paul. I refuse to speak to you. When you <laughs> can I, I, need you. Can I, I let, let me just let me just counter that actually with two things because I said we're breaking new ground, and it's a really good point you're making. Yesterday, XXX Temptation went live on Licked, and his biggest song, "Sad," has had 1.3 billion streams on Spotify, and it is live and claims free and available for licensing into a creator's video on Licked as of yesterday. That is a huge win for us, right? I remember the days when we were counting how many streams the entire catalogue would have had on Spotify to try and push home the point that we were a commercial catalogue. And now one song comes along that's got 1.3 billion views, right? Streams. Um, That's a groundbreaking moment for us. And as of this morning... Um, we moved to a blanket deal with BMG, which means 130,000 tracks from some of the world's biggest artists will be delivered to Licked in the next month. Again, we did that deal eight, 14 months ago, but actually the, the, the fulfilment of it has been so difficult until now that 
we're setting new trends and new precedents with these partners to be able to provide creators like you and your community um, with the solution they deserve. Yeah, that's amazing. Like, congratulations on building something so incredible. Uh, I think all of our listeners, if you haven't checked out Lit, uh, they are definitely going to now, whether you're an independent creator just starting or, a, you know, a big company that is looking for production music for your videos. Lit is the place to uh, to check out. Thanks so much, Paul. Can you just quickly let us know where we can find out, uh, follow more about what Lit is doing yeah. and uh, what you're doing as well? Yeah, just quickly, you said at, 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 you just called it production music. It's commercial music. Let's make that clear. <laughs> yeah, um, commercial music for commercial your music, yeah. YouTube production. Um, so you can find us at uh, Lit.co. That's L I C K D dot co no e uh, and then all our socials are the same it's at get licked g-e-t-l-i-c-k-d paul thank you so much and i wish you and lit the best for the future tom keep up the cracking work mate you're always doing great things and i love to see it As uh, I was saying, that was a highly impressive interview, highly enlightening. I love that Paul's doing this. It's so needed and he sort of like has the right mindset for it. It, it sounds like he has like a lot of work and a lot of battles ahead <laughs> of yeah, I think I think he's probably fought through quite a few battles already. But, you know, when you were messaging me um, before we were recording saying, like, this is such a great service, I think I, I signed it up with, you know, it's such a great piece of software, such a great service. But really, it's the music that's going to make it or break it. And now I think they're really breaking through into those top tier artists, top tier tracks that's really just going to make them like a household name. And uh yeah, the sky's the limit, really. I think, you know, I think he's announced partnerships with the biggest record labels in the world. So obviously there's a huge operational side in, in bringing that uh, to fruition. Yeah. But yeah, you know, the, the sky really is the limit. I love his argument, you know, when he was he's talking to certain artists that, you know, they're like, why, why should we get on this? Because, you know, they're already making the money and the artist, you know, it says, well, no, well, no, because the, the, the top creators will just avoid using you. And it's like, you want those top creators to use you and you want to make money off of them. So why not find a solution for this? Right. So it makes so much sense. That's such a like the moment, right. When it comes to the, the music industry, music industry is always is the most, one of the most frustrating industries in the world. The, the, uh, to me, it's always a, an industry that just does not look at the future. They yeah. just look at, at like what's happening right now and does not look at opportunities, does not think of growth opportunities. You know, people, you know, go to them and pitch them and, you know, it takes a uh, Herculean effort to convince them to do something. So uh, kudos to Paul. Yeah. And I just think, you know, that makes total sense because they're just so powerful. Yep. They are so powerful. They've got so much more custom tools and stuff on YouTube, back end of YouTube. Like for each individual artist, obviously they're also at the mercy of the record label and the music industry to a certain extent. But if you look at the record labels themselves, like why would they care about any individual artist? Because overall, they've just got a constant stream of, of royalties coming in. And obviously, they've taken a hit, you know, with the, the kind of death of CDs and cassettes and even MP3 sales to, to the streaming sites. But still, overall, they're... Oh, they're they're making it. They're making a ton yeah. more money. That's the the part that they're like that. You know, they don't talk too much about about right. Like the the, the whole issue of like those sales being gone is over. And I'll add a link into the description that I tweeted out as Video Insiders yesterday or a couple of days ago. By the time you get this podcast, is Hank Green's interview on the Recode Media podcast. He goes into like the deep reasons about how. YouTube's essentially hamstrung because of their relationship with music, the labels, and how the labels basically control everything behind it. And as like his insights into that is like totally in line with everything that's happening right now. It's like at the end of the day, like he has a controversial opinion that YouTube should just like completely disassociate itself to 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 music. But that's like a big <laughs> thing to yeah. ask. But um, at the end of the day, like there's a lot a great argument as to the fact that like yeah, music has a lot of control over YouTube and you know, 
prevents YouTube from prevents creators from doing a lot. And uh, thankfully, Paul is finding a solution for that. So it was a great interview. Loved it. I literally instantly after listening the rough of this interview, I PM would Paul on LinkedIn. You know, I went behind uh, Tom's back and PM Paul, <laughs> and I was like, "No, oh, Tom, talk to me. <laughs> Boop, <part. laughs> we'll scratch. We'll, we'll scratch that that square word." But um, Anyways, thanks very much, Paul, for, for joining us. We'll put links to Paul's LinkedIn and Licked on the uh, description on the show notes. And uh, you should definitely go check it out. Now, before we head out, we obviously wanted to thank our sponsor, TubeBuddy, which is the ultimate tool for creators to streamline their daily workflow on YouTube, allowing for more time to make great content for brands to help reduce busy workflow and focus on what matters, growing your business on YouTube, for agency to help manage multiple client channels, for networks, which gives partners the tools for success and an attractive incentive for recruitment. Tom, we have a special offer. We do indeed. You can get an exclusive multi-channel discount only by visiting videoinsiders.fm forward slash TubeBuddy. Thank, Thank you, TubeBuddy. Buddy. Great catching up with you, Tom. And obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, we'd really, really appreciate a year old review on the old Apple podcasts. And even if I think on Spotify, there's some sort of like star system or, you know. Yeah, give, it a, give us a star on Overcast too. Yeah, Overcast and whichever application you listen to podcasts on. So have yourselves a great couple of weeks. We'll see you next time. See you soon.